All right, welcome back. This video will be a little bit short because we're just going to focus on this part before we have more like full length videos on more details about receptors. So with this, again, we looked at passive, active, and bulk active transport in the previous video. Um, that would have been video eight. And so this will be video nine. We'll be focusing on receptors just a little bit. And then we really hit them hard in video 10. So a receptor, uh, the thing that binds to a receptor is called a ligand. Like with enzymes, what binds with an enzyme in the active site is called a substrate. But with receptors, it's called a ligand. And I'll have a receptor that has a specific shape that's complementary to its ligand. So you might not be able to see it, but there's an L in there for ligand. If I have a different receptor, then it'll bind a different ligand. So when this ligand hits this receptor, I'm going to pass the message off. So everything before this, particles, molecules, were actually, ions, whatever, um, were actually moving into or out of the cell. Things were physically passing through. Here the message is getting through, but the ligand is not. So pretend that this ligand was superpolar, or pretend that it was like, you know, gigantic, something like that. So we can't really build a channel big enough to let in this giant thing. Um, that's called an exploding cell. So what I want to do is I want to somehow get this message inside without this being able to cross the barrier. So this receptor is attached to this protein. Proteins that are buried in the membrane, they might call them transmembrane proteins because they span across, transport, um, they're located across the membrane. And on the edges of the membrane, so if I had something sitting on the outside or something sitting on the inside, those are on the periphery of the membrane. Again, if if this is my membrane right here, then that's the middle. Out here would be the edge and out there would be the edge. That's on the periphery, like my peripheral vision is on the edge of my vision. So in case you missed it, it was that. So this is a peripheral protein, but what can happen is that receptor and that peripheral protein will be chemically uh, mated to each other in such a way that as is, that guy stays put. But as soon as that ligand hits that receptor, that receptor now goes through a conformational change. It changes its shape. And when it changes its shape, this guy is now let go. So I kind of compare it to this. I'm holding on to this blue guy right here, but as soon as the right ligand, so I'm a receptor, that's the blue guy. And as soon as my ligand comes in and touches me, then I change shape and I let go of that. We saw this earlier with enzymes in the enzyme review video, allosteric inhibitors. Here's my active site in the middle. It perfectly fits my substrate. Again, receptors fit ligands, but enzymes fit substrates. Perfect fit. Now, whenever my inhibitor entered the picture and bound right there, I could change the shape of my protein far away, like that. So that's what I'm doing. This hits this, conformational change, and then what we're going to see in the next video is typically this protein will activate another layer of proteins. I'll make them a different color. You know, so maybe it activates like 10. I'm drawing four. I know the difference. Uh, maybe it activates 10 of these, and each of those will activate like 10 of these. So I'm amplifying the signal as I get it inside but the message made it in even though the molecule didn't. Okay, um, next up, here's a receptor and an enzyme, two for one. So what you're seeing on this screen, by the way, sorry, is sort of how this receptor system works that I was talking about. Okay, the next picture that I'm gonna put up on the screen is this example, on one side it's an enzyme, I'm, I'm sorry, on one side it's a receptor, on the other side it's acting as an enzyme. So whenever the ligand, they're calling them signal molecules in this picture, whenever the ligand hits the receptor side, then now it activates this enzyme. So let's say that this enzyme has a substrate that is green triangle. Right now that active site doesn't fit green triangle, but whenever, hang on, got too many triangular things going on, Let's say its substrate is a round circle. Right now, that active, that active site doesn't fit a round circle. So as soon as the right ligand comes in, 
there's my ligand, it'll hit this receptor, that receptor changes shape, and now I have, with that shape change, change the active site, and now that active site is supposed to anyway, it's kind of a mess up, but that active site is now fitting this substrate, so now that guy goes in as a substrate and then exits as um, a product. Maybe it gets broken in half. That looks like a butt. So, yeah. And, and I actually took art classes. So, it goes in and then comes out as a product. So essentially what that means is I could have a nearby cell send out a ligand and that starts changing chemical reactions inside of this cell. Almost like somebody gives me information about my diet and then I change what's going on inside of me. So now the outside world can help manipulate my inside world. All right, here's another one. This one's really common. It's called a G-linked receptor and it uses a G-protein pathway. Here, we're doing that same thing as this purple one, but for whatever reason, G-linked proteins are more common um, than this one. So we're basically breaking it down into two parts. Here I have a receptor side and an enzyme side um, all in one. Here I break it down. I have the receptor portion. I'll put an R. And then I have the enzyme portion. So now the way that it would work is if my ligand hits that receptor, there's this G protein. Um, that G protein is activated and inactivated with GTP, so that's why they call it a G protein. It has nothing to do with gangs. And so now, I've got this G protein. Whenever that ligand hits that receptor, this G protein is set free. He goes over to the enzyme. That enzyme, once he bumps into the enzyme, that enzyme changes shape. And now that enzyme is in the on position. That's what you're seeing in this picture. So my G protein that runs on GTP will slide over and then you'll see how it changes the shape of this enzyme. And now the enzyme is running chemical reactions. And this is pretty short lived, the GDP to GTP cycle. So that means that um, I have precise control. Um, if it was long lived, I send out a signal and then for the next minute this enzyme's on, then I don't control it very well. But whenever I send a ligand, if it slides over and turns off this enzyme for just an instant, then I can turn it off instantaneously. If I want it to be on more, I just keep sending out more and more and more ligands. Over here, I have an anchoring protein. That's why I put A, and it's doing exactly what it sounds like. It anchors stuff. So the most low energy state of cells is a sphere. But nerve cells are like big, long fibers, almost like copper wires. They even function kind of like copper wires, carrying electricity. And so with an anchor, that's sort of holding the shape of a cell. For example, um, we'll just focus on this portion over here. Here's a cell, and it's spherical. I know it's on a 2D board, so technically I'm drawing a circle, but in real life, in 3D, it would be a, a sphere. And what I can do is I could put anchor proteins up here, anchor proteins down here, and if I get some cytoskeleton, some cell skeleton, uh, microtubules, intermediate filaments, stuff like that. I wouldn't worry about the names much. I could take some of those cytoskeletal elements and drag them across there. Then what if I could shrink down that cytoskeleton? Kind of like actin and myosin in a muscle, it could, it could shrink down. So if I do that, then now the shape of this sphere becomes more like this because I took these strings that on my board right now are about three inches tall, and if I shrink them down to the where they're about one inch tall, here's my strings, then now I basically made the shape of a red blood cell. And so that's how red blood cells get their shape, is anchor proteins are holding them in. So here is a pile of red blood cells, and if I cut open a red blood cell on the inside, I can see these anchoring proteins, and I can see, I'm not sure how well it shows up for you, but I can see these little strings of cytoskeleton that are kind of tightening it down. So cytoskeleton with anchor proteins can kind of hold the shape of a cell. So in this picture, for example, 
they've got the cytoskeleton in green. And you can see that it's holding the shape of this cell. The blue is the nucleus. Here's some cytoskeleton holding the nucleus in place. All right, so those are anchoring proteins. The last one that we want to look at before we get into receptor details in the next video is cell identification. So the way that your immune system generally works is it just looks for things that it doesn't recognize and then it will attack them. So if I'm a macrophage, macro means big, micro means small. So macrophage, we saw that phagocytosis means to eat. So if I'm a big eater, a macrophage, that's a type of white blood cell, they go around eating things. How do they decide what to eat? They essentially eat anything that is not covered in Mr. Cotton glycoproteins and glycolipids. Glyc again, we've seen before, means um, carbohydrates or sugars or glucose. So I've got a hexagon with an oxygen in the corner. We know that that means carbohydrate. Could have been a pentagon with oxygens in the corner. And they're linked up to a protein. So we call this a glycoprotein. If I had them linked up to a lipid, like you can kind of see, um, here's a chain of carbohydrates. Let me zoom on that a bit. So here's a chain of carbohydrates stuck to a purple protein, so that'd be a glycoprotein. That's what I've drawn. If instead they were stuck to lipids, like this one is, that'd be a glycolipid. Well, glycoproteins and glycolipids um, are kind of like a fingerprint. They are unique to an individual. If you have an identical twin, they should match. If you have a brother or sister, they'll be a closer match than with you and some other random person that's not a relative. So essentially what my white blood cells do is for now, I'll kind of have to, you'll have to just sort of accept the way that I say this. It's like they know, we'll see how whenever we teach the immune system unit, um, but they know what Mr. Cotton glycoproteins and glycolipids look like. So if I'm a white blood cell, I go around and I'm just checking stuff. And so here's a cell, I bump into it and I'm like, these are full of Mr. Cotton glycoproteins and glycolipids, cool. This is full of Mr. Cotton glycolipids and glycoproteins. Cool. So is this. Then eventually, maybe I get to um, this object. I bump into it and I'm like, I don't recognize these glycolipids. I don't recognize these glycoproteins. So what do I assume about this? It's not Mr. Cotton, so it must be an invader. So I do phagocytosis and try to kill it. That's how I should um, be able to deal with a sickness I've never seen before. So whether it's COVID or flu or whatever, when something enters my cells that I don't recognize, I attack it. I recognize it based off of its glycoproteins and glycolipids. As a group, they call that the glycocalyx layer. I'd have to look up and see the significance of calyx. Um, that word's insignificant to me. Um, this is also what we're trying to match if like, let's say that I need a kidney donation or something like that, and they're trying to find a quote unquote match. They're trying to find glycolipids and glycoproteins, and then these proteins called MHC proteins, and see how they match. If they match well enough, my immune system will be okay with that kidney. If they don't match, then whenever some random person donates a kidney to me, my immune system is gonna think it's foreign and attack it. So if I could get a twin to donate a kidney, my immune system should be fine. It got fooled. It thinks it's my own kidney. It doesn't realize it's my twin brother's, let's say. I don't have a twin brother. Um, but I do have a brother. So let's say my brother donates a kidney to me. That'll be a closer match. So my immune system should be more tolerant. I might still have to suppress my immune system with immunosuppressant drugs, which is kind of dangerous because then I'm susceptible to COVID-19 or whatever. I guess SARS-CoV-2 the virus that causes COVID-19. Um, so cell ID, like another example is maybe this configuration we call A for blood type A. And if I have a different configuration, a different branch system, then that's blood type B. So those identify cells to my immune system. It's like walking around and my immune system, this will be my last analogy and we'll shut off the video. Um, it's like my immune system at Timber Creek would be just walking around making sure that you were wearing purple. If you're wearing purple, it's like you're a Timber Creek Falcon. If somebody walks in with a red jersey, I just kill that guy, right? Now, is he from this school or that school? I don't care. It's not purple. I don't care if green walks in or red or blue or yellow, whatever. I'm just, I'm going to attack anybody in a jersey that's not purple because that's not a Timber Creek Falcon. Just like if I'm a team, 
I don't care who I line up across. If I turn around and there's a purple guy, he's on my team, we're together. If I look ahead of me and there's somebody else, I just run him over. I don't really care um, if I identify what high school they're from. They're just not a Falcon, so I just crush those people. Um, all right, we'll stop there for today, and for the moment anyway. And then our next video, we'll get into details of receptors.